Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Welcome to a new uh, webinar of uh, on pre-modern Islamic manuscripts organized by the uh, Nomad's Land uh, Nomad uh, Man Project uh, based at the Institute of Iranian Studies of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we are very excited about the uh, talk today. Uh, this is a project that uh, is uh, funded by the FWF um, of the Austrian uh, government. It lasts for six years and we try to investigate aspects of uh, transculturation between the 13th and the 15th century in Iran and Central Asia based on uh, manuscripts. So uh, today I'm gonna pass the floor to one of uh, my colleagues uh, here at the project uh, who will introduce our speaker for today. Uh, the talk will be from around 40 to 45 minutes or so, and then we will open the uh, floor for questions. Remember, you can ask uh, in the chat or uh, post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, you can see. So I pass now, without further ado, to uh, Hadel to introduce our speaker. Hadel, please. Thank you so much, Bruno, and uh, please excuse me, my voice is a little bit shaky. I'm getting over an illness. Um, but uh, I will be introducing Dr. Lemaire. Um, my name is Hadil Jarada, and I would like to welcome you all to the third event in our webinar series on pre-modern Islamic manuscripts. Today, we will host Dr. Uh, Joab Lemaire, an independent researcher based in the Netherlands who has published a great deal about Islamic manuscripts. Um, Dr. Lemaire is a scholar and researcher on medieval Islamic history and thought. He received his PhD from Leiden University in 1992. Since then, he has published a number of important studies on medieval Islamic thought, among them his Al Farabi and Aristotelian syllogistics, and another work titled Concept and Belief in Sadr al Din Shirazi, which won the prestigious Iranian Book Prize of the Year Award in 2005. He has also recently published an edition of the Arabic translation of the Nasirian ethics. He has also worked on several important initiatives with Brill. Dr. Lemaire was responsible for Brill's recent re-edition of Story's Persian Literature, a biobibliographical survey, uh, which is in five volumes with, with an additional uh, index volume. Dr. Lemaire is also known, particularly in the non-German speaking world, for his translation of Brockelmann's Geschichte, the History of the Arabic Written Tradition, a foundational bio-bibliographical um, source used by scholars in Islamic studies. Dr. Lemaire has, has a number of important forthcoming works. These include an edition of Lawkari's Bayan al-Haqq bi Daman al-Sidq, which is on philosophy, and a trilingual Persian, Arabic, and English edition of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi's Fusul dar Usul. He is also preparing an inventory of Abu Nasr al-Farabi's surviving logical works, which promises to be exhaustive. Dr. Lemaire's articles have addressed the history of logic in the Islamic world and the Islamic manuscript tradition. In 2013, he alerted us to the need for a new edition of Avicenna's Kitab al-Isharat with Tanbihat in an article he published in the Journal of Islamic Manuscripts. More recently, he has published an article on Tulsi's mystical treatise, the Awsaf al-Ashraf, which he will speak about today. I'd like to sincerely thank Dr. Lemaire for accepting our invitation to present on his work, and I very much look forward to his presentation today, titled, On the Value of Written Evidence, the Preamble of Nasir al-Din al-Tulsi's Awsaf al-Ashraf. Dr. Lemaire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dr. Charada, and thank you, Professor De Nicola, also for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, dear colleagues, friends, and other co-participants, let me share this screen now with you. Um, so, um, if I understand the Nomads Manuscripts Landscape Project well, the idea is to study the so-called paratext of a sufficiently large and representative collection of 7th to 9th century Hijri manuscripts, Persian and Arabic, to see whether there's evidence of transcultural activity 
involving the nomad culture of the Ilkhanids and the Timurids on the one side, and the sedentary culture of the conquered peoples of Iran and Central Asia on the other. That there was such transcultural activity seems quite likely. As an example, I mentioned the construction of the famous observatory at Marara near Tabriz, Iran, commenced in 1259. The work was commissioned by the Ilkhani ruler Hulagu and carried out under the supervision of the famous scholar and statesman Nasiruddin Tursi. And this observatory yielded results. Results that were put down in writing, notably in Tursi's astronomical tables, the Zijje and Khani, dedicated to Hulagu's successor Abaka, which is thus a written trace of the cultural interaction that the research project is about, even if the motives for the construction of the observatory may not have been quite the same on either side. Another example is Rashid Din Hamadani's early 14th century Jame Tawarikh, described by some as the first world history ever. Composed in Iran for the Ilkhans Razan and Ojaitu, its aim was to set out the history and the condition of the Mongol people. Conquerors of the world, followed by a description of the other peoples and nations of the world and their histories. Given its unprecedented scope, Rashid, vizier to both rulers, mobilized a whole team of specialists, informants, and collaborators to assist him in this task. Making use of written and oral sources, the part on the Mongols especially is a key source on the emergence and organization of the Mongol Empire, while the second part constitutes the first attempt ever at writing a history of the world. So again, a very important written trace of cultural interaction. In both cases, we are not talking of paratext, but of famous astronomical and historical works. But apart from these and other examples of cultural interaction and engagement leading to the production of books, paratext may constitute an interesting tool for the reconstruction of the larger social cultural context in which works like those just mentioned and others were commissioned, written, or studied. Paratext, as I understand it, is a blanket term uh, for all the textual elements in a manuscript that are not part of the main text itself. Here, you can think of statements of ownership, seals, glosses, vendors' notes, textual embellishments like the addition of poetry, household notes, etc. On this first folio of this manuscript, we can see several statements of ownership here and here, seals, another one, and lines of poetry, all paratext. On this manuscript, we see in the margin of this collective volume of text by Avicenna, a buyer's note or vendor's note, difficult to say, stating that the work was bought in 804, 1401 or two. The reason why I read the number apparently the other way around is given in my article towards a new edition of Avistena's Kitab al-Sharadwa Tambihat, uh, referred to just now by Dr. Charada. Um, the person who wrote the gloss refers to his comrade, um, Ahuwuna, the famous Qutb al-Malbubin, Qutb al-Din Shirazi, a star student of Stusi. And it is here, you can see it. Ahuwuna al Fadil al Qut al Malbubin al Shirazi, Salamahu Allah wa Abqahu. 
um, this means that the person who wrote the gloss was directly acquainted with him. From the edition, Sallamahu Allah, may God keep him safe, we may infer that Qutbuddin Shirazi was still alive when the gloss was first written. Now, given that this manuscript was copied in 734, 1334, and that Qutbuddin Shirazi died about 25 years earlier in 710, 1310, there is reason to believe that this gloss was copied wholesale from another manuscript. The reference here is to interaction between Shirazi and Tursi. Here we see on folio 2A of the manuscript Leiden Oriental 683, which I will discuss in a minute, we see some household notes in the form of recipes for the removing of stains in turkeys. In this manuscript from Berlin, we can read the dedication of El Amidi's Kesh Tam We Had, Fishar uh, uh, the dedication to El Malik al Mansur, then the Ayyubid ruler at Hama in Syria. These are all examples of paratext. Dedications to patrons, like the one shown just now, cited in the preamble of some work also belong to the paratext around that work. They inform us on who likely commissioned to work and thus made it possible. So if Ilkhanid or Timurid patrons are mentioned in works written by members of the sedentary elite in Iraq, Iran, or Central Asia, it seems reasonable to say that there is a case of cultural interaction in the sense that money from the one side was allocated to produce a book on the other side. In other words, the work was willed to be by a patron from his own values and interests, be they personal, political, or otherwise, and created by the beneficiary willing to be sponsored and acting from his own motives and interests. Now, it so happens that there is a text from the period and region in question with a dedication and which might be explained as a case of intercultural or transcultural activity. But is it so? And if yes, in what sense? Well, we'll see. The remainder of my talk will center around the manuscript Leiden OR 683-1, which is an ancient copy of Nasiruddin Tusi's short Persian manual on mysticism, the Ausaf al Ashraf. The Ausaf al Ashraf is a text about mysticism rather than a mystical text. It is a relatively short work, about 11,000 words. In six chapters, Tusi gives a succinct, matter of fact like description of various aspects and stages of the spiritual journey of man towards mystical self-annihilation, fanat. The Ausaf al Ashraf is usually seen as a complement to Tusi's famous work on philosophical ethics, the Akhlaq al Nasiri. This is because there being two kinds of wisdom in fulfillment of the theoretical and practical faculties of the soul, the Akhlaq al Nasiri gives an account of practical wisdom in its various forms, while the Osaf al Ashraf is about the achievement of the highest level of theoretical wisdom beyond man's rational understanding of the universe in the form of mystical unification and knowledge divine. While taking its inspiration from Sufi and traditional sources, including the Quran and the traditions, the Al-Saf al-Ashraf stands apart by its sober, rational approach and presentation, meaning that it was directed at the educated more than at the average aspiring mystic. As such, it left no great imprint on later generations comparable to the influence of the widely popular and much imitated Akhlaq al-Nasiri. 
According to Nasrallah Purjavadi of Tehran, one of the important features of the Ausaf al Ashraf is to see quite unexpected defense and possibly the first by a Shi author of mystics like Bayazid Bastami, 9th century, and Mansur al Hallaj, 10th century. Usually, it is stated that the Ausaf al Ashraf was composed in the final years of Tusi's rich career as a scholar, scientist, and statesman. However, as I hope to show, the Leiden copy of this treatise puts the self-evidence of the accepted view very much into question. In the following, I shall first give a dis brief description of the manuscript Leiden OR 683, of which the al Safar Ashraf forms a part, and then follow this up with a discussion of its preamble as compared to the standard version of this text. It will then be concluded that the al Safar Ashraf must be a relatively early work written during Tusi's period with the Nizari Ismainis, somewhere between 633 and 654, that is 1235 and 1256. A conclusion that will be the basis for our appraisal of the value of written proof. The manuscript is a Persian manuscript, seven fo 70 folios paper. Two texts by Nasiruddin Tusis. First is the Ausaf al Ashraf, which you see here. The interesting thing is that on the backside of the first folio of this manuscript, the title was uh, first uh, wrongly uh, cited, Akhlaq al Nasiri. And you see the same on the first uh, uh, folio of the, uh, of the text itself. You see Akhlaq al Nasiri. While the wrong title was not corrected on the first folio of the text, it was uh, corrected on the backside of the flyleaf, and there you see Ausaf al Ashraf. The reason why there may be uh, Akhlaq al Nasiri here is because the Akhlaq al Nasiri is mentioned here, where he says, I first wrote a book called the Akhlaq al Nasiri. And it may be because of that, that the wrong title was put there. Um, the other text is the Mi'yar al-Ash'ar on metrics in poetry, of which you see here uh, the first uh, uh, page. The Ausaf al-Ash'raf is undated, but the dating of the Mi'yar al-Ash'ar may be an indication and the hand of the Ausaf al Ashraf, while different from that of the Mayan al Ashar, would also seem to be consistent with this. In the colophon of the Mayan al Ashar, uh, the work is said to have been copied in Kerman on the Salch, the end, in this case the 29th, of the month of Jumada, the second of the year 610. You see here, the Salch, Jumada, Abla. لسنه 10 و 700 ب معامر كرمان معامر as a plural of معمر an inhabited place with water and people and so on um, uh, the name of the copyist is not entirely clear the two texts were not copied by the same scribe oh just a minute here uh, the collective volume contains as far as i can see just one statement of ownership this statement of ownership, which you see here, um, uh, comes at the end of the Ausaf al Ashraf and is in a hand different from the copyists. Written in an ornate kind of script and undated, the name of the owner appears to be Ahmed ibn al Mawalidi was Saifi. Here you see Ahmed, and here maybe al Mawalidi, and here was Saifi. Yeah, a Saifi refers to himself as a Mamluk here, Mamluk, yeah, uh, which ties in well with the fact that Mamluks in the time of the Bahri and Burji Mamluks of Egypt and Syria would take the Nisba as Saifi if they wanted to express allegiance to an Amir with the title of Saifi, sword of the faith. 
The Bahrian Burji Mamluks range from 648 to 923, 1250 to 1517. And there were about 30 rulers, great and small, who carried the title Saif Adin. Of these, the first was Al Malik al Muzaffar, who reigned in 667, uh, 57, I'm sorry, 1259. And the last, Al Malik al Adin, who reigned in 906, 1501. I think it will be very difficult to further narrow this down to the reign of any specific Saif Adin. Given that the statement of ownership comes at the end of the Al Saf al Ashraf, it is certainly possible, though not necessary, that this work first circulated separately before the Meyar al Ashar came to be joined to it. In this connection, it is worthy of note that folio 33 has the function of a flyleaf for the second treatise, there being a clear separation between the choirs of the first and those of the second text. The fact that there is no apparent difference between the kind of paper that was used for either text is consistent with my earlier hypothesis that the undated Ausaf al Ashraf was copied around the same time and maybe even in the same place, Kerman, as the Meyar al Ashar, which is dated 710, 1310. There is an undated note of purchase on folio 1A, top here, you can see, uh, stating a value of 150. I can maybe, uh, yeah, I'll show you a little bit, bit better. You see, Ishtaraina an Sheikh Mahmoud, and then I don't, I'm not sure what the last uh, name is. Um, um, let me see. Uh, and so the value is 150. In what currency remains to be, uh, remains unknown? It is likewise unclear whether the buyer and the owner mentioned at the end of the text of the Ausaf al Ashraf were one and the same person or not. And neither do we know whether the purchase con concerned the Ausaf al Ashraf alone or that the manuscript was in the state in which we have it now and thus included the. Uh, in his Fihris Nuskhahay Khatiy Farsi, Ahmed Munzawi recorded some 60 copies of the Ausaf al Ashraf, mostly in Iran. Of these, the oldest date or could date from the 8th 14th century. There's, those are numbers 1 to 5. In his Fihris Tegan Nuskhahay Khatiy Iran, published more than 40 years after Munzari, Muhammad de Royati records a total of 169 copies. Among these, there is another 8th, 14th century copy contained in the famous Safineye Tabriz, a collective volume of more than 200 texts on a wide range of subjects copied in Tabriz in the years 721 to 723. 1321 to 1323. In his edition of the Ausaf al Ashraf that will be referred to presently, Abul Fad Muradi mentioned another manuscript that I have seen and likely dates from the 8th, 14th century. And to the above copies, we can now add Leiden uh, 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 OR 683 slash 1. From among the copies outside Iran, the manuscripts Istanbul, London, and Leiden are thus far the only ones known or estimated to date from the 8th, 14th century. The Asaf al Ashraf was printed many times, with the earliest known printing produced in Iran in 1266, 1850. Most printings are Persian, but some early printings were also published in India. Most of these printings, lithographs, movable types, offset, are straightforward without any critical apparatus and based on some manuscript available to the publisher. In addition to these various simple printings, there are just three editions, none of them satisfactory, by Harawi, Shamsuddin, and Muradin. 
even if there is a lot to say about the quality of the printings and editions produced so far, and the need for a new authoritative edition, they all have one thing in common, which is their preamble. For the available printings and editions, indeed, in all of the manuscripts of the al safa Ashraf that I have seen, save the one from Leiden, Tusi explains that we owe its publication to the personal intervention of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sahib Edivan, of the Ilkhanids, Shamseddin and Juwaini. This is also the only reason why it has always been maintained that Tusi wrote this treatise in the final years of his life. However, the, in the Leiden copy of the al Saf al Ashraf, El Juwaini is not mentioned at all. This is potentially very important. So let us try and get to the bottom of this. In the following, I am going to collate the preamble of the oldest dated manuscript of the Ausaf, which is MS Tehran collection Mahdawi number 593, and that is the canonical version of the preamble. I'm going to collate that with the preamble of the manuscript Leiden uh, OR683, which might well be dated around the same time as its accompanying Meyar al Ashar, which is 710, 1310. In the Persian and English text columns that I am going to show, black type refers to text found in both copies. Blue type refers to text found in manuscript Leiden only, and red type refers to text found only in the Mahdami manuscript. But here's first the beginning of the Al-Saf al-Ashraf in the Mahdami copy. You see, it looks very beautiful, very beautiful manuscript. You can hardly believe it is so old. And here is uh, the Leiden manuscript which uh, is uh, 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 a little uh, less uh, easy to read, but still readable, but it has uh, a bit of damages here and there. Um, let me now uh, read to you the translation of the preamble as it is in the canonical version of the Mahdari copy. That means that I'm going to read just the black and the red text in the slides that will follow. A reading that I will then follow up with a collation of the Mahdawi and Leiden manuscripts and discuss with you the results. Now I start to read. Having completed his Nasserian ethics, a work on noble dispositions and good governance in the way of the philosophers, the writer of this treatise and author of this discourse intended to compile an outline of the spiritual journey of the friends of God containing an account of the practices of these visionary people in accordance with the principles of the wayfarers and the seekers of truth divine, based on the standards of reason and tradition, containing the subtle theoretical and practical points that constitute the kernel and essence of that discipline. Countless preoccupations and vain obstacles did not permit him to carry that out. And what he had in mind could not emerge from potentiality to actuality. Until this moment, when the compelling order that this plan be executed was given by his lordship, his eminence, the administrator and prime minister of the empire, master of the sword and the pen, the elect of the eminent from among the Arabs and the non-Arabs, the shining star of the truth and the faith, the glory of Islam and the Muslims, chief of the viziers in one world and the other, holder of the high office of the dominions, pride of the elite and the nobility, the embodiment of justice and benefaction, the world's most meritorious and perfect, the refuge and shelter of Iran, Muhammad ibn Sahib Said Baha'uddin Muhammad al Juwaini. Such having occurred, and time and opportunity being favorable, even if countless preoccupations and obstacles remained, I'm so sorry, um, the author recorded in the chapter of this brief treatise, impediments permitting, all that came to his mind in explanation of the truths and subtleties aforementioned, such in compliance with the order of this great man, 
and in obedience to his command. He named it the attributes of the noble, and should it be approved by the noblest of all, its purpose would be achieved. If not, and in view of what has already been stated by way of excuse, it is hoped that his noble self, with its excellent dispositions and virtuous habits, will cover its lapses with the mantle of his forgiving grace. May God, glory be to him, in the same way as he has distinguished him with sovereign leadership in the world of appearances, grant him divine grace and everlasting bliss in the world of absolute truth. Indeed, he is gracious, the answerer of prayers. So this was the preamble as we all know it, the canonical text. On analysis, the reader will find some slight differences in the first part of the quotation as follows. The addition of um, uh, Muhammad, uh, Ibn, uh, uh, Muhammad the Tusi in L uh, and uh, Karime instead of Gozide in L and uh, Gardanad, uh, where do, aha, Gardanad and Karde and and um, then of course in the end here we have Bidan Amr and Be'on Maham. But this is not so important. The real difference comes in the second part, <clears throat> where El Juwani is complete and absent from the copy preserved in Leiden. It could of course be argued that the archetype from which the Leiden copy was made must have been defective or difficult to read so that the part on El Juwani could not be copied. One could, for instance, suppose that the text as found in Mahdavi was illegible from the words Keeshara at the beginning all the way until Tamam Yaft at the end. This, however, is not a likely scenario for the following reasons. First of all, it is statistically highly unlikely that such a neat, clear-cut, self-contained piece of prose should become illegible exactly from the beginning and precisely until the end. Also, one would expect the imaginary archetype to enable the copyist of the Leiden manuscript to resume his work after this in a way that suggests that he had Mahdavi's version in front of him. But this is not what we see, for in the third part, which we are looking at now, uh, not only is Hal replaced, there's a different place, and do we read Takrir instead of Tahrir? Um, um, we see, and more importantly, that Tusi's statement of, on what caused the Ausaf to be written is different in each case. In the manus Leiden manuscript, it is the final cause. For what purpose was it written? For the benefit of the wayfarer. Well, in uh, Mahdawi, uh, it is the ultimate efficient cause. What ultimately made it happen? Juwani's order, the proximate efficient cause being to see himself who wrote it. But then the ending of the third part is in both fragments exactly the same here. It's exactly the same. I think that the likelihood of a second, very neatly marked unreadable fragment, yeah, that is uh, 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 this, yeah, this, um, um, within the space of a mere couple of lines, necessitating the copyist of the Leiden manuscript to invent a phrase of, him, of his own in structure oddly similar to the one in Mahdavi is next to zero. The fourth and last part, finally, uh, there the change is complete. On the one hand, we see a change of focus away from a plural ash, uh, let me see, ashraf, uh, to Ashraf, to a singular uh, Ashraf. Um, uh, uh, and next, there's the addition of uh, his noble self. 
ذات الشريف او which um, um, uh, to connect the text to al juwaini and finally there is the term daulat which you see here and here um, daulat has various meanings among them felicity or bliss and also power or dominion what we see is that in the Leiden version, daulat is used in the sense of bliss alone. Eh? Be daulate do jahan. Daulate do jahan has one meaning. Um, um, in the other version of Mahdawi, daulat appears to have been split in two. In relation to the world of appearances, daulat was replaced by the almost equivalent Sarwari wa farmandahi. Sarwari here. Farmandahi. Yeah. Uh, here translated as sovereign leadership. Well, in relation to the world of absolute truth, daulat in the sense of bliss was maintained here. Bliss. Uh, bliss. Okay. Uh, in view of all of the above, I think that the conclusion must be that the Leiden copy contains an alternative version of the preamble to Tusi's Al-Safal Ashram. Now that it has been established that there are two versions of the preamble to the Al-Safal Ashram, the question is which version is the earlier one, Mahdavi or Leiden? I think this question is not difficult to answer. As stated earlier, the dedication in Mahdavi is to the El Khanid Chancellor of the Exchequer, Shamsuddin al Juwaini. From the moment that Al Juwaini had obtained this position under Hulagu in 661, he was to remain in office under three successive rulers until he was put to death in 683, 1284. This being the case, and Tusi himself having passed away, sorry, uh, let me see. I, let me see. Oh, aha. So, I, excuse me. And Tusi having himself, himself passed away in 672, the letter is not likely to have retracted the dedication to Al Juwani at any point in time. This means that uh, the Leiden manuscript contains a redaction of the Al Saf al Ashraf that is earlier than the one contained in the manuscript of the Mahdawi collection. Now, even if I think that the above conclusion is inevitable, someone could still object and say that, yes, the preamble was indeed rewritten, but only after Juwaini's and Tusi's death, in a world where the balance of power had changed and El Juwaini was removed from the preamble by his scribe. While this is certainly possible, in that case, one would expect the scribe to have just taken out the unwanted elements rather than rewrite the text. For besides taking out the dedication, it would have been sufficient to remove just a few other sentence parts from the text in Mahdari, like so. This would have been enough. As can be seen, there would have been no need to do anything more than remove some crucial elements in the way indicated uh, above. This is also much more in line with what one would expect from a scribe who had received some instructions, real editing being the work of authors, not scribes. This is why the suggestion of a later dating for the Leiden version which is based on the argument from changes in power is in my view, not tenable. Also, the likely age of the copy preserved in Leiden and the fact that it is the only copy known to contain the alternative preamble as against close to 200 copies with the preamble contained in manuscript Mahdari would together seem to indicate that the preamble in the Leiden manuscript embodies the earlier and not the later version. In this connection, it is important to note 
that there are more cases in which Tusi is known to have changed a preamble in light of changing circumstances. His influential ethical companion, the Akhlaq al for instance, was originally completed in 633, 1235. For Nasir al-Din, Abd al-Rahman ibn Abi Mansur, the leader of the Nizari Isma Ismailis in the Kuhistan region in northeastern Iran, where Tusi resided at the time. In uh, 654, 1256, the Mongol invasion led to the collapse of the Nizari state and the surrender of its last ruler, Rukhneddin Khurshah. Having remained with Rukhneddin until the very end, Tusi was then recruited into the service of Rukhneddin's adversary and founder of the Ikhani dynasty, Hulagu Khan. Circumstances having changed, and the Akhlaq al-Nasari already being a popular and much copied work, Tusi decided to adapt its introduction to better reflect the political realities of his days. And the introduction to his astronomical treatise called the Resaleya Mu'iniyyeh, originally written for Abu Shams ibn Abd rahim the son of Nasir al-Din ibn Abi Mansur just mentioned, was also changed. This being so, the Ausaf al Ashraf is merely one of several treatises whose preamble was rewritten at some later point in time. I do not believe that the introduction of the Leiden copy could be a draft version that was written after the Mongol conquest and later finalized to include the dedication to Al Juwaini. For in that case, one would not expect Tusi's reference to the work's intended readership for the benefit of the wayfarer and the seeker of this, his presence to be replaced instead of complemented by a dedication to El Juwaini. There was no need for replacement. In his new preamble to the Akhlaq al-Nasiri, Tusi states that the work had already gained much popularity by the time that he came to re-edit it. This is why the old preamble and colophon could still be found and appended to some of the ancient copies of the second edition of the Akhlaq al-Nasri. In the preamble of the copy of the Ausaf al-Ashraf preserved in the Mahdavi, uh, Mahdavi manuscript, no reference is made to the previous existence of this work. And of the version preserved in Leiden, just one copy is known. This is why it would seem that the Ausaf al Ashraf, while completed before the Mongol invasion, only received a wider circulation after that date. In connection with textual differences between the earlier and the later version, other than the preamble, and basing myself on a comparison between the Leiden and the Mahdavi uh, manuscript. These are mostly stylistic and may involve tenses of verbs, vocabulary, phraseology, omissions, and additions. All in all, I think uh, there are more than 700 of these, of which only a small part appears to be uh, due to scribal errors. A detailed study of the textual history of the al Saf al Ashraf will therefore have to be included in a much needed scholarly edition. Whatever the outcome of such a study, these textual differences are consistent with the idea that the Ausaf is a work that had remained relatively neglected for years to be brushed up after the Mongol invasion, given a fitting preamble, and then presented to El Giovanni, the top administrator at the Ilkhanid courts. As for a tentative dating of the later version in the Mahdavi manuscript, it should be remembered that El Juwaini first took office as Chancellor of the Exchequer under Hulagu in 661. Tusi's dedication of the Ausaf to him in, in the Mahdavi manuscript makes explicit mention of Juwaini's rank. Oh, sorry, uh, Sahib uh, Diwan. Um, uh, 
and Giovanni is still being in office by the time of Tusi's death in 672, the latter must have inserted his dedication to him somewhere between 661 and 672. In connection with the dating of the earlier version in the Leiden manuscript, it is important to point out that the first edition of the Akhlaq al Nasri was completed in 633. In the preamble of the Ausaf al Ashraf, the Akhlaq al Nasri is referred to as a work already completed before then. It does seem safe to assume that the original version of the Ausaf al Ashraf was written somewhere between 633 and the fall of the Nizari state in 654, 1256, and conceivably closer to 633 than to 654. I think this is as much detail as can be provided at this point. This much about the Leiden version of the Ausaf al Ashraf and the need to revise the common view on its date of composition and move it back in time to a date before the conquest of Baghdad. Let's get back now to the subject of the value of written evidence in relation to the Nomads Manuscripts Landscape Project. In order for me to make my point, it is important to note that in the past, there has been discussion about Tusi's motives in writing the al al Ashraf. Among the explanations given is the one by Nasrallah Pojavadi, who contends that there being no proof in the Ausaf al Ashraf that Tusi was the mystic himself, he must have written it merely because he had an encyclopedic mind and felt he could write on any topic whatsoever. A more or less opposing view is the one advanced by Wilford Madelung, who, drawing his inference from the dedication to Al Juwaini, a Sunni, suggested that Tusi, a Shi'i, wrote the Ausaf in an effort to unite all Muslims under the common banner of Sufism, which had significantly gained in popularity under the Ilkhanis. Indeed, in Tusi's eyes, and here I quote Madelung, Sufism, if anything, could break down the barriers between the schools and sects and unite all Muslims under the banner of the great Sufi orders, unquote. If this were to be correct, it could be argued that given that the Ilkhanids with their policies favored the spread of Sufism, with Tusi picking up on this and providing the Vizier and Juwaini with a kind of brochure that could help him in unifying the Muslim factions in the Persian regions of the Ilkhanid dominions, that under those circumstances, the Ausaf al Ashraf truly represents the fruit of transcultural influence and cooperation, be it merely factual or intentional. However, the above discussions have made it clear that initially, the Ausaf al Ashraf was not dedicated to Al Juwaini, so that this conclusion may not be drawn in this way. One could still argue that the Ausaf was instrumentalized along lines suggested by Madalu when Tusi dedicated the work to Al Juwaini, but originally the work itself was not written for that purpose. All we know is what Tusi says himself in the prologue in the Leiden manuscript, that he wrote it for the benefit of the wayfarer and the seeker of truth divine. Nevertheless, and while sharing Purjavadi's skepticism on Tusi having become a Sufi, I do think that given Tusi's political versatility, it is absolutely possible that he, himself not a Sufi, for reasons of political pragmatism, decided to promote the Sufi cause. So, while originally the Ausaf had nothing to do with the Ilkhanis, the later use that Tusi made of it can certainly be explained as resulting from transcultural interaction. This is because the Ilkhanis, from their own values and interests, favored Sufism, an attitude that conceivably caused Tusi from his own values and interests to instrumentalize 
in order to unify the Muslims of the Persian world in the best interest of all. Finally, on the value of written evidence, the Leiden copy of the Ausaf al -Ashraf is important in as much as it necessitates a revision of the conventional view that this work was written after the Mongol invasion. As such, it illustrates the need uh, to be cautious about drawing conclusions from dedications, no matter whether these regard the period in which or the motives from which a particular work was written. At the same time, the Leiden copy might be seen as an argument in support of Madelung's thesis on the exploitation of Sufism to serve the Ilkhanid and the Muslim cause. On this interpretation, the Leiden copy may be regarded as helping us to identify the dedication to al Juraini in the canonical version of the Ausaf as a very special case of paratext of great relevance to the Nomads Manuscript Landscape Project. Thank you.